The year is 2004, and you're in middle school, nonchalantly watching TV on the Canadian block Bionics after an episode of Inuyasha finished. After the credits start rolling on what's considered to be the female equivalent of Dragon Ball Z, you decide to watch the next show in line before going to bed. What started off with two brothers happily watching their experiment come to life, your eyes and ears are met with a cacophony of distressed screams. One had his arm and leg severed, followed by a guttural cry for help from witnessing a disfigured, mangled corpse that manifested from their scientific stunt. Fast forward to 2023, and 20 years since it first aired, Full Metal Alchemist, specifically the 2003 version, I still look to it with fond memories, though some parts of it do look quite dated as expected for a show in the early days of DigiPaint. The initial shock and bewilderment of being exposed to unmitigated brutality eventually matured into fond admiration as I grew to understand some of the subtler facets in the anime that my younger self couldn't fully register at the time. Hi, I'm Suen. If you're new to this channel, salutations. Let's start with the basics. I think pineapple does belong on pizza. Does that depress you? Good, because this show is chock full of it. Daddy? <laughs> Are you hurting somewhere? For context, I'm one of the boomers who thinks the 2003 version is superior, partially because it's the one I saw first, and I fully admit that my nostalgia affects my adoration for the series. However, I do not particularly care that Brotherhood decided to gloss over and rush through the initial arcs of the story. Full Metal Alchemist is a pretty big manga. Some compromises had to be made, and it was pretty clear that Brotherhood was created to service those who had watched the 2003 series and wanted a more faithful adaptation the entire way through. I don't think the show should lose points or favor for that matter, because I would argue the latter half is what makes the Brotherhood experience enjoyable and stand out for what it is, a very polished and refined work that rightfully should be considered the benchmark of what the best anime in the shonen demographic can offer. It's a constant hit after hit of hype moments, and it never stops delivering until its final episode. Because of this, I consider the 2003 and 2009 series as different entities, because their tonal deliverance and direction resulted in two distinct creative visions. Trying to rate and determine which functions better as an adaptation is, in my opinion, counterproductive. Because there's no point trying to compare something that, outside of sharing the title, characters, and setting, obviously had opposite approaches. The job of Brotherhood was to create a faithful and completed adaptation to an already good manga. FMA 2003 took said source material of what was still ongoing at the time, narrowed the scope, and turned it into a character-driven narrative, to the point where it's almost dubious to even call it a typical adaptation, because the latter half is completely original, or if you're uncharitable, filler. Filler. Fullmetal Alchemist by Hiromu Arakawa is a work that while it had its moments of despair, was an overall and entertaining watch that services to the masses and the best compliment I can give, with a happy ending that our heroes rightfully deserved. It's a series that felt completely satisfying and checks everything in the list of what makes a fun anime from beginning to end. In preparation, I watched a couple of Brotherhood episodes just to refresh my memory, and unsurprisingly, found myself having just as much fun as I had in my first watch. I see. And before I knew it, was on a binge, so its charm hasn't worn off after all these years. Even though I knew exactly how the next episode was going to play out, the first-class performances from the actors, a perfect concoction of multiple genres that never oversteps each other, and the animation picking up at crucial moments, it's very apparent why this series is universally loved. Never at any point did I feel the anime was slow or wasting my time, and for a series to accomplish that is no small feat. Brotherhood is a well-balanced, consistent line of lean, high-quality content with very little deviations, packaged against a backdrop of great world-building in its universe, supported by an equally colorful cast. The 2003 anime is, uh, <laughs> well, a little bit all over the place, as it tries to find its footing initially, but I would argue the process of figuring itself out and how it eventually got there is one of its main appeals. My body's normal again! I mean, not normal, normal, but normal! 
The biggest difference between Brotherhood and the 2003 anime, apart from the obvious divergence in the plot, is the atmosphere, the overall mood set throughout the series. Fullmetal Alchemist 2003 is unapologetically grim. It's upfront in what it wants to achieve by exposing the worst aspects of humanity, by placing the characters in rigorous mental and physical tasks. I appreciate that it decided to not hold itself back out of fear of alienating its viewers or fear of censorship, but as a side effect, it would be understandable that the original felt less like a work of entertainment and more of a psychological marathon that tests your patience. At worst, it can come off as self-indulgent in its depravity, but oddly enough, it almost has a gallant quality to it. Its mission to explore the pitch-black underbelly of human nature through the Elric brothers' unrelenting quest for the truth really makes you doubt if the subject matter was appropriate for its demographic. There's a dark, macabre cloud that hovers over the series that, by the time the second half started, its presence came out to the forefront. A human drama of damaged characters that incrementally discovers just how corrupt and twisted their world is. While there were some lighthearted moments sprinkled here and there, especially in the beginning, that ominous, unsettling feeling always had a firm grasp on the shoulder that is the story, hence why I think some people understandably were put off by this transition. While there are many events and characters that share commonalities, their fates and the emotional response constructed as a result of these creative visions is what sets the two apart and, by extension, drives their respective narratives forward. Between the two of us, we'll figure it out. Elements of this change is further supported by the character designs. Though it's possible that the angular look is a reminder of the style guide of the early 2000s, it's noticeably sharper compared to the manga and 2009 counterpart. The fullness of the cheeks and rounded eyes in Brotherhood gives off a friendlier vibe that makes it easier for the audience to warm up to. While the original's designs have an older and weathered look, as if the signs of hardship are already showing its effect. The color palette has an earthier tone that aligns well with the darker subject matter discussed in the story that was used to great effect to reserve for somber scenes. In contrast, the bright saturated hues and children's storybook aesthetic in Brotherhood match the equally unique and eccentric personalities of its cast and various settings within Amestris. We alchemists are such hopeless, predictable things. If the palette of Brotherhood is warmth and approachability, the 2003 version did the opposite with solitude and isolation. I don't know how to fully describe it, but as more characters inch towards the truth, you can feel a wall that initially wasn't there slowly building up between them. Not out of suspicion, but from a need to shield others from whatever terrible revelation they come across and to intentionally handle this on their own. Even Edward and Alphonse, as close as brothers can ever be, aren't immune from this and end up hiding select things from each other as the story progresses to the detriment of their trust. The audience have the privilege of knowing everyone's thoughts and desires that are open to us, while the cast must figure this all out for themselves. Winry is the biggest victim from this, as both brothers purposefully keep her in the dark, which can be a detriment to her development. Ed especially doesn't fully open up to her feelings to the very end and his hesitancy to allow quote-unquote outsiders from intervening in their personal issues is a stark contrast to his brotherhood counterpart. How can you say that? What about grandma and me? We're a home that's always been here. Why do you want to keep shutting everything out? <laughs> For example, when their family home was burned down to remove all traces of their childhood memories. In the original adaptation, both Pinocchio and Winry were absent when this happened, but in Brotherhood, both are present. The Rock Bells are like family to the Elrics in every sense of the word, regardless of what version you watched. But Ed and Alphonse believe that their sin was theirs alone to bear and no one else, and this belief stayed consistent throughout the 2003 anime. Others were kept at a distance and unable to step foot into their personal circle, a complete opposite in retrospect when you compare the final scenes of Brotherhood and how emotionally satisfying it felt after the build-up. Equivalent exchange! Huh? The quote-unquote Nakama camaraderie, a bond that brings the group closer together through the power of friendship and teamwork that we've become familiar with isn't there. Whether it's the fight scene where an ensemble cast team up and give it their all against the villain, or the powerful spur-of-the-moment dialogue that unites the people against a common cause. Those critical moments of synergy that were strongly evident throughout Brotherhood was absent in the original. I'm not trying to say Ed's some antisocial person. He just doesn't get close to anybody. 
Loss, whether physical or emotional, is no stranger in the 2003 anime. It becomes a core theme throughout the series, showcasing the damage done to the characters that permanently changes the course of their journey and ultimately live with the consequences of their actions. Mustang losing an eye, Edward never retrieving his arm and leg, or world back, and Alphonse while he did regain his body and eventually his memories at the conclusion of Conqueror Shambhala with great effort, like his brother is permanently separated from his world and unable to return. Winry, an orphan with only her grandmother as her only living relative, has to cope with the fact that her two childhood friends whom she considers family are never returning despite her unwavering loyalty. Shao Tucker, while he deserved his sentencing and early exit in Brotherhood, is spared in the 2003 anime, but arguably is given a crueler ending, with him descending into insanity, cradling the hollow shell of Nina's body. But no other group represents this theme perfectly than these guys. <laughs> If there's any change that I lament in the manga, it's how the homunculi were treated. In the 2003 anime, they were the embodiment of their creator's mistakes, a visual reminder of the transmuter's sins and the price they paid. A homunculus is created when an alchemist attempts human transmutation, which means theoretically each have a unique identity. From a character-driven perspective, this is a genius move since their involvement will inherently have a deeper connection to the cast. Since human transmutations are performed out of an intense desire to revive a deceased loved one, they take the physical likeness of the person they're supposed to resemble, but only retain a fraction of their memories. And because of those missing fragments, it leaves them psychologically damaged and prone to easy manipulation, opting to channel their confusion through violence and destruction like an emotionally stunted child. <laughs> This gives the homunculi leverage against our heroes, with the ability to toy with the emotions of those who have attempted to revive them. However, they're also at a disadvantage when their memories are at the mercy of their master. Furthermore, they can only die when a possession tied to their original identity is nearby, meaning that the finishing move must be done in close proximity, instead of a firearm or other long-range combat that provides some disconnect from the act. Their characters are forced to get up close to the monsters and directly confront them. The homunculi's origin stories, I will argue, is one of the best parts in the 2003 anime because it showed the extent of how much Full Metal Alchemist as a series was willing to get personal. Initially labeled as sentient monsters, the addition of their backstories humanized them and added depth to what we originally thought were just homicidal creatures. I want you by my side. Forever. Lust, envy, sloth, and arguably wrath were the biggest benefactors to this change. They all share a much deeper connection to our heroes, and as a result, the emotional scars that are dealt to them are more impactful. And it's because of these relations that tests the mental strength of those affected. When Sloth is eventually revealed to be the homunculus of Ed and Alphonse's mother, you can feel the weight of their guilt from playing God. How gut-wrenching it must have been for Edward, Trisha's own son, her flesh and blood, forced to dig up his own mother's grave in order to correct a mistake that he made at her expense. He quietly whispers, I'm sorry, repeatedly for forgiveness, using her remains when she should have been laid to rest in the town she loved. The truth knowing that Sloth must die, but this drives a wedge between the persistent Edward and the gentle Alphonse, who pleads with his brother to, quote unquote, stop killing their mother. Don't you understand? If we don't get rid of them, they're just gonna keep hunting you down! How about Izumi Curtis? When she learns that Wrath is her stillborn son, it creates an awkward rift between student and teacher when Ed takes it upon himself to finish the job when she is unable to carry out the task. Envy being the firstborn son of Hohenheim is a half-brother of Ed and Al who was jealous because of Hohenheim's favorite treatment over his other sons and feeling left out of the fatherly love and acknowledgement he desired. Dante, despite being an anime-exclusive character, was Hohenheim's first lover and, by extension, shares a connection to Envy and the brothers. I doubt the two of us will meet again. While the connection the homunculi have with the cast is the highlight, they aren't the only ones nor the closest. She was your mommy too and you killed her! <laughs> 
when Winry's parents are executed by Mustang in the 2003 version, versus being accidentally murdered by a mentally delirious Scar upon learning his sibling died in Brotherhood, it feels more personal. You're telling me it was really a state alchemist who killed them? Yeah, I heard it was an alchemist whose power was fire, and somebody praised him for what he did. The fact that her family was killed by an admired figure in the military who she respects creates an uncomfortable divide, knowing that this is the man who sticks his neck out for her childhood friends. But in the end, one cannot erase the glaring fact that he was the one who shot her parents, and on top of that, had to clean up their remains after finishing the job. Mustang, on the other hand, has to live with the burden that he murdered innocent doctors, saving lives at their own risk. They were the symbol of good, people who only wanted to help others regardless of their faction. Having to carry out those orders on top of his involvement in the Ishvalan War in his younger years, we see him crack. The charming yet calculating colonel with a love of miniskirts we were introduced to had a moment of vulnerability and almost took his own life with the very weapon he used to kill Winry's parents. Mustang is visibly more shaken and scarred in this version, and instead of using those tragedies as motivation to relentlessly move forward and achieve his ultimate goal, we see him falter and experience chronic remorse from the permanent damage on his mental state. And for that you're willing to throw away everything you've worked for your entire career. Without a second thought. Not so different from you, is it? Smaller changes were also done to minor characters such as Barry the Chopper. His debut is one of the moments I feel highlights FMA 2003's darker approach to storytelling, where it shines a light on the truly depraved and despicable. Gone is his humorous intro and impish behavior that temporarily disarms his serial killer image. Instead, you're treated to a scene that reveals just how truly twisted he is. After being knocked out and held captive, Ed frantically tries to navigate himself in a freezing slaughterhouse, surrounded by butchered pigs hanging from the ceiling. In a more controlled situation where he has the upper hand, he would know exactly what to do. Rescue Winry, bravely confront Barry who is no match for his automail, and arrest him for his crimes. But he's not in control. In his distraught state of mind, he knows saving Winry is the priority, but a combination of the cold temperature, being chased down by a psychotic murderer, gleefully swinging his cleaver around, and the unruly setting of being surrounded by death puts him in a fight or flight situation. Ed is no longer in control and acting purely on animal instinct, frantically trying to save himself. Keep in mind, he's only 12 years old when this happens, and he went face to face with a murderer. Deep down inside, we all want to kill. Most just need the go-ahead from their society. Imagine how that trauma affected his mental state, and no matter how much one can prepare for these situations, at the end of the day, he's just a child, forced to confront a scenario that even grown adults cannot fathom. Or another scene when Lust teases the Slicer brother's imminent death by slowly scratching away his blood seal in front of Ed's horrified face, with Alphonse at her mercy, unable to move and get away from their clutches. The sound of her fingernail feels purposefully loud and drawn out, like nails on a chalkboard, as each swipe chips away at the blood seal. It's these chilling moments to Ed that weighs in on his psychology, and hardens his resolve that no matter how much you mentally prepare, it's those split seconds and critical moments you act on that determines life or death. Or when the Elric brothers' expulsion of Father Cornello in the beginning initially led their naive selves into believing that they liberated Lior from a zealous despot. What was supposed to be a transition from a theocratic state to a secular one, the opposite happened when we learned the brothers created a worse situation than the previous. Ed believes he saved that town. It's one of the first successes he's had. I'll let him keep thinking that for a while. He'll learn the truth soon enough. We always do. So, I guess it's goodbye for good. Full Metal Alchemist is about give and take, that life is a harsh reality and shouldn't be seen through the lens of the naive, or else you will learn unsettling truths that shatter your innocence. The narrative direction and, by extension, the ending, is what solidifies the original as great and memorable. It revels in this and is unapologetically honest about its incompletion. The open-ended and unsatisfying conclusion, the rickety story that, at times, slogged its way through a barrage of questionable narrative and creative decisions, the downright unpleasant and vile characters you meet along the way, and the checkered blemishes are what ironically makes it so beautiful. 
Full Metal Alchemist 2003 is an anime about introspection, a show that, in my opinion, ironically adheres to the theme of brotherhood better than its remake, and ultimately, it's a story that celebrates life. It's great not because of the darker narrative compared to its original source material, but because it's a celebration of the struggle and fortitude to strive for something better. Compromises, unforeseen events, and unexpected detours will affect our journey and the path that we imagined don't always work out. That's just life. Yes, the characters don't receive the ideal ending they deserve. Yes, there are questionable writing decisions that deride at the overall enjoyment. Yes, it is more dated and visually doesn't hold up as well as Brotherhood. Fullmetal Alchemist 2003 is gritty, grotesque, and can sometimes feel too giddy in showing the extreme losses some of the people go through but never did I once feel like it was done out of malice. It's an intense look at the good in a world that's twisted and cruel. They have an amazing fortitude to live, even in the darkest of moments. And sometimes, that itself is the beauty. All the people you helped along the way, all the hardships, the pain of losing friends you loved, the determination, sweat, and blood. Don't you think that may have been the price you paid 